Well, hello everyone. Um, welcome today to today's joint seminar between the Centre for Global Mental Health and the Mental Health Innovation Network. My name is Lucy Lee and I'm the coordinator of the Mental Health Innovation Network. Um, today's seminar is really quite special because the welcome is not just to those here in the room, but it's also to those online because this is the Mental Health Innovation Network's very first webcast. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with MHIN, as we like to abbreviate it, um, the network was set up with the aim of fostering and supporting an online global community for researchers, practitioners, decision makers, educators and advocates to share what works in mental health and to get it scaled up. The fact that this is a webcast means that we may have MHI and members watching online from all over the world, and it also means that today's presentation will be available online to be accessed again and again. This fits really nicely with the topic of today's presentation, which is all about accessing knowledge online. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Erica Frank. Um, she's the founder of NextGenU.org. Um, it's essentially the world's first free university operating as an online learning tool and offering courses in the health sciences, currently operational in 181 countries worldwide. This is opening up learning opportunities to researchers and practitioners in the field of health sciences all over the world. And it also fits really quite nicely with the theme of London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine's annual symposium, which takes place here in the school tomorrow, um, and which is focusing on strengthening capacity in research globally. Eric is going to talk for maybe around 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open this up to the floor for your questions. Um, for those of you joining us online, you'll be able to ask your questions via Twitter by tweeting to at mhinnovation, or by emailing your questions to mhin at lshtm.ac.uk. Our team is going to be monitoring these throughout the seminar, so please send questions whenever you'd like to. And there may be some of you using our webcast software, Panopto, and those of you who are, who are able to access its comments and questions facilities, please feel free to use them. Um, it really depends on the institution you're in, so it may be that it's not possible. If it's not possible, feel free to tweet or email us. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Erica. Uh, many thanks, Erica. Welcome. And we're really delighted to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Really pleased to be here. Um, it's a lovely occasion. On, as you said, this is we have a lot of uh, shared interests with the um, MHIN and delighted to get to be here for your inaugural webcast. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to be talking with you all about today is nextgenu.org, which, uh, as Lucy said, is in essence the world fir world's first free university, um, and how we're globally democratizing, starting uh, in the health sciences, how we're globally democratizing education. Yes, please. I believe that I am. Yep. It, yep. Perfect. I'm Thank glowing and yes, Great. green. Perfect. I. I presume that all of you on the webcast will tweet or email or do something dramatic if I'm inaudible. So um, th that would be another question you could ask is, why can't I hear Dr. Frank? So um, good. So presuming that you can, this is our home page. Um, and you may be thinking this is a MOOC. Uh, talked to a doctor before the presentation who said, you're going to be talking about online education. Well. Part of it's online, but we're not just a MOOC, we're a doohickey. And I'm afraid for people outside of North America, that's not a pun at all. So in North America, we have this term of a doohickey. When you can't think of what something is, you say it's a gadget or a tool or a doohickey. Well, this is our doohickey, a democratically open, outstanding hybrid of internet-aided, computer-aided, and human-aided education. So we're beyond just a MOOC. There's a lot of human interaction with what we're doing. And that's one of the things that makes us different from current, other current offerings. So I'm going to be kind of walking us through these different characteristics that we have. We have about two, um, two dozen characteristics I'll be talking about. About a quarter of them, as you can see, are um, encompassed usually by traditional educational institutions, about a quarter typically by MOOCs massive open online courses. And about half of them are characteristics that NextGenU has that traditional universities and MOOCs, neither of them typically display. First, though, I want to talk to you a little about why we're doing this. So you all may be, I hope, familiar with this document with the Kampala de Declaration. WHO says we need more than 4 million health providers now, an additional 13 million more trained in the next couple decades, 
And we all know that if we're doing it just the same way that we've been doing it, trying to get funding to create bricks and mortar institutions, that we're going to just fall further behind. So WHO says, and I took it pretty seriously, that we really need to use information and communication technologies to make this happen. So this is how we typically look at the world, is with a landmass, this is how we usually look at it. But if we look at it in some different ways, we can see that there really is a huge educational shortage, starting from the very beginning of the educational process, and including physicians. And we can also see that this has huge implications. So I just want to toggle back and forth for a moment with the disproportion in this slide and the disproportion in this slide. And these two slides alone to me mean that we have to do something to be able to create more physicians and other health providers uh, to be able to address these kinds of problems. Happily though, this is another slide which shows that we have a tool now, uh, a tool that at first was only available to a privileged few in high income countries is now of course becoming uh, globally available to many people and will inevitably become globally available to even more as the technology improves and as the price descends. So let me tell you some about uh, what, what we are and how we use the, this tool, um, these information communication technologies, including talking to other human beings um, to address this problem of the health provider shortage. So first, I'm going to talk about the two characteristics that most people concentrate on about NextGenU that is particularly novel. We're the only organization that is for credit for free. Uh, so that's our most important characteristic. And these are some of the organizations that provide some of that credit. These are our founding collaborators and funders. Um, uh, added over the last 13 years since I started NextGenU, uh, in 2001. These are nice things that famous people have had to say about NextGenU, and for people to watching this online, I encourage you to pause and read this thoroughly. For the rest of you, though, we'll continue onward. This has um, been wonderful because um, this kind of project, of course, attracts a lot of uh, like-minded people, and we've had very good reception uh, to our creation of this. So. Um, there are several points that I want to make here um, in terms of what we're able to offer. So MOOCs are fabulous in a lot of ways because they are limitlessly scalable. They're really low risk. Really the only risk to trying is the time that you spend on learning. The barriers are low. The barriers of place and of cost being the most important ones. Uh, they're low carbon emissions. You don't have to travel to a university. Uh, we also um, are, there are two additional pieces that we've added. Uh, we're advertisement free, so none of our resources have any ads and none of our pages have any ads. Uh, and we're available asynchronously. So MOOCs um, often have start and stop dates. Uh, traditional education pretty much always has stop and start dates and we're able to uh, provide education asynchronously whenever someone wants to start or stop it. We also uh, ha are quite financially efficient, and this is our business model, grateful learners and inspired donors. Most recently, this has manifested in a $16 million endowment from the Annenberg Physician Training Program in Addiction Medicine. That will be of particular interest to you all for a few reasons. I know that um, there are a lot of people who have particular interests in addiction medicine who are here and who are participating in this globally. Uh, it also means that we're here to stay. Um, that endowment will cover our core expenses really in perpetuity. Um, but our biggest donors really come from the people all over the world who have created these learning objects that we use to create the resources. And I'll show you some of that later, but we really bank on the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of extraordinary learning objects, learning resources, text, atlases, videos that already exist online from our four accredited sources, universities, specialty societies, peer-reviewed journals, and governments. And those four sources provide high-quality, free, 
resources, uh, and that's really our biggest donation. Our second biggest donation really comes from the people who have put together our courses. Um, and I hope that some of you, including some of the people online, will uh, get excited by this notion and think of a course that they might want to not just take one of our courses, but potentially help us assemble and offer courses as well. So that's really been our, our biggest uh, set of donations. I want to spend a, a few minutes on these next three characteristics, on the fact that we're providing higher level education, graduate education, starting in medicine and in public health, which really isn't uh, offered very much by many MOOCs. Um, we choose the best resources that are available on any particular topic to address any specific competency. So it's not just one generous uh, professor saying, I'm going to give you my materials, but we choose the best resources that are globally available. And we are able to provide a coordinated curriculum. So by the middle of next year, we'll have a full school of public health available. And if you've taken our environmental and occupational health course, for example, you won't see the same resources unless we know about it also in the epidemiology course. There won't be duplication and there won't be gaps. So the, co uh, the curriculum can be coordinated. So let me show you some about how this manifests. These are our currently available courses. Uh, and I know you all are particularly interested in these two courses, and I'll come back to them in a moment and dive in in a little greater depth, but I want to give you a bit of an overview first. Uh, so, and these are our upcoming courses, and you can look at these, obviously, in greater detail if you'd like to on the site under Courses. So, this is the first course that we offered, Emergency Medicine. First course we offered globally, launched that in March of 2012. Um, and uh, this is the, uh, the most recent training that we've offered. Um, this is our family medicine residency, and I'll, I'll let you know when to go ahead and start that. No, no, it's good. Go ahead and move to it, but then I'll let you know when to start it. Um, so I'm going to play you a one-minute video from our colleague there, uh, Dr. Abdel Nasser. Um, he's going to tell you a little about the family medicine residency program that we're offering there to 10,000 family medicine residents in Sudan. So uh, go ahead and let's listen for one minute to Dr. Abdel Nasser. I can read it in their subtitles and that, that. Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I'm sorry you don't have the pleasure of getting to hear them, but yes, when they started in Sudan, there were 10 family physicians there, um, and they convinced the government um, to create a training program for 10,000 residents. Um, and he believes they have a strong tool uh, to scale the training up using NextGenU. Um, we met at a meeting similar to this. This program is a joint mission between their Ministry of Health in the state, uh, also with the uh, Ministry of, uh, with the Faculty of Medicine in the state, and also with the Ministry of Telecommunications. So it's coordinated universities and governments offering it, and the health insurers. And we're able to use their uh, anonymized electronic medical record to be able to quite sophisticatedly study uh, the outcomes of this educational approach. Um, and we also are able to use the platform to be able to link their growing cohort um, of uh, family docs in Sudan then to, the, uh, to each other and to a global cohort of family physicians as well. So, this is, uh, we're able to uh, make this happen uh, in a way that really builds a global community of practice and allows people to train in place as well in rural and remote areas in Sudan. Um, shall, I, shall I get us to there? You're getting us to there. Good. Sorry if any of you have vertigo and troubles here. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Um, 
So the second residency program that we're starting is preventive medicine. Um, and uh, th this training, uh, because that's my medical specialty, we have quite a deep bench of uh, US-based uh, collaborators in this, uh, including uh, the Specialty Society, American College of Preventive Medicine, uh, as well as um, our other partners. Uh, we're going to be piloting this training uh, in the United States, in uh, Texas, and in Washington, and in Quito. So this is a three-year-long preventive medicine residency program that will include um, the, all the core courses in public health, uh, and uh, hopefully by the middle of next, gen next year, we'll also, also have a degree. Uh, this will be the world's first free degree that we'll be offering, which will be an MPH. So that should be ready by the middle of next year. So you can't, you can't stop your tuition here. Uh, <laughs> um, some other of the courses that we're offering, climate change and health, and all of these are co-sponsored by a university and by relevant um, accompanying organizations. So in the case of climate change and health, we have the George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communications from Washington, D.C. as our university co-sponsor and uh, 350.org and Physicians for Social Responsibility uh, as our, uh, and the International Society of Doctors for the Environment as our organizational co-sponsors. We do this for quality control, to create our advisory committee, to review the courses, uh, and to give our learners some uh, sense of satisfaction that the certificate they have comes from an accredited university always uh, and also brings the expertise of these organizations as well. Environmental health uh, is the first core course in public health that we're offering. Um, we, and I'll show you some of the data on how these, these courses have performed, uh, including our pilot test of this in my uh, home city of Vancouver. War and health. Uh, and this is just to dig in a little further, showing you a bit this is what a module looks like. Trade in Health is another course that's going to be available soon. Pediatric Cardiovascular Disease Prevention. Now let me just dive in a little more into the two uh, trainings that we're offering now that I think will be of particular interest to this cohort uh, on substance use. This first one for primary care docs, so a fairly comprehensive, several weeks long course that say a resident or a senior medical student might take um, as, a, as a rotation, as an elective that they might, might take. And then this one, which the screening course, which is available for community health workers is the target population for this. So to give you a little preliminary data um, from this project, we have a a uh, $1.1 million grant from Grand Challenges Canada on this. This is a small preliminary uh, look at what that's yielded. Um, so we concentrated on this uh, because we have uh, this uh, huge global need uh, to address these problems and because we were fortunate enough to be able to get some funding in this area as well to be able to create and quite actively test this course in Kenya. So uh, what we're proposing doing is integrating substance use training into primary care. We're working with practitioners who are active in the area now and with community health workers who are active in the area now, combining again computer-based learning with local peer and mentored activities. So our partners in this are the African Mental Health Foundation um, and uh, nextgenu.org, obviously, and University of British Columbia, which is where I'm on the faculty. Um, what we're doing is combining this MOOC-like model plus peer and mentored activities to create a doohickey. Um, and there are three courses that we're starting with here, these first two that I showed you and then a third one on practice support um, in addiction medicine that we're developing as well. And they're based on uh, WHO's ASSIST model and on the mental health gap uh, of WHO as well. So we're piloting this innovation and we're testing its impact with a randomized control trial. So the important things that we're dealing with is we have this intervention that we developed with our primarily North American partners, but also with our Kenyan partners. We want to make sure that this works well in multiple contexts. Our expectation is that 
the basic science uh, knowledge kinds of components get transmitted with the uh, online learning and that it becomes customized and locally relevant and culturally competent with these mentored and peer activities as well. But we needed to test which parts are useful and what we have to do to adapt. So um, we supported these social innovators, our colleagues in Kenya, uh, to see what's working. Um, and uh, this is a complex innovation as described by Patton. Um, because this is, uh, requires some degree of being an early adopter, much like the Sudanese training that we described, uh, being an early adopter in a low resource setting and uh, figuring out how to implement it. And of course, they're built in all of the problems that are often built into trainings in substance use in terms of stigma um, and uh, concerns about dealing with substance use. So this is an iterative framework that we use uh, to, uh, to, uh, to test and then to feedback and to improve. Uh, so we have three main pilot sites um, at Presbyterian University of East Africa, at uh, Kenyan Men uh, uh, Medical Training College, and at Mathari Hospital, which is the main uh, medical uh, psychiatric hospital in Kenya, and I visited with these folks a few years ago in preparation for launching this. Um, our outcome metrics are surveys, journal writing, data collection, and direct observation, and then doing interviews and discussions. And uh, our co-PIs have worked on this, um, and we use analytic techniques that I really hope you won't ask me to describe, uh, because it, I'm only an MD, MPH, I'm not an MD, PhD. So. Uh, but I'd be glad to have others answer questions if you have uh, concerns or questions about the methodology. So in our pilot, uh, we found the trainees um, uh, describe some obstacles. They want feedback and support, so we know that we can't, can't just do a good education with just online components. There have to be mentored and peer components as well, so people feel part of a community. And there are technical obstacles, of course. Um, they were nervous about the peer and mentored activities. It's a, you know, it's a new kind of way to learn, and uh, so we had to sort of ease them into that as well. And it adds to their workload and time, of course. But we've gotten positive reviews. Um, they, as you'll see from a, a little of this preliminary data, they feel like it's increased their competence and decreased their sense of stigma for their patients, which was really remarkable to me that we were able to, to um, uh, transmit that. And they didn't have concerns about using materials primarily from high income countries, again, because they were able to customize it with their own interactions. Uh, obstacles in terms of the uh, instructional system that we found, it's hard to find mentors. That's going to be an ongoing uh, issue for us, we know, but uh, the best way that this has worked as a system is for institutions to adopt the course, professors to adopt the course and say, I'm not going to have the time, nor will I need, to do the knowledge transfer component, but I can meet with you a couple hours a week and you can do all of your knowledge transfer online. So uh, as mentors began to realize that this allowed them to accomplish their educational goals for teaching people without having to spend so much time on it, they've warmed to this as well. Um, uh, making sure that uh, the credit is acknowledged, so we have on this training, University of Florida, Africa Mental Health Foundation, um, Annenberg Physician Training Program. So we wanted to make sure that there were enough uh, shiny accreditors and sponsors on this that learners would really feel that their certificate was meaningful at the end. And we found that that was indeed the case. We had, we've had really good reviews of the materials um, and um, they are uh, a heightened appreciation for computer-based learning, that's the CBL there, uh, as a way to teach. Uh, and with the clinical systems as well, we've overcome uh, some obstacles. Um, they, uh, it was not the clinical norm to use the ASSIST model and this rather structured brief intervention, but um, 
this has also led to uh, a, a greater appreciation for uh, use for teaching about and also for improving issues around substance use disorder in primary care. So we've uh, dealt with the cultural context uh, with this local customization. Uh, we've dealt with the novelty of this by exposing people and having them try and getting good feedback. Um, and we've uh, been listening carefully. Uh, our, our PIs are all except for me right now are right now all in Kenya, uh, listening to how this is working and figuring out uh, how we can improve both the mentored activities and also the, the other components of it as well. So um, clearly we need to continue to listen to these kinds of uh, cultural issues from our partners, from our learners, um, and to deal with the technical obstacles. And that's part of what happens as you get going, is dealing with these kinds of issues. So um, we are, uh, because we're working on a grant, of course, we have the pressure of deadlines. And that's always tough, but we're uh, coping with that to the satisfaction of our learners and our funders. So, uh, and we're doing uh, our uh, qualitative and quantitative data collection. But as always, those are, it's hard to collect these kinds of data, but we're, we're managing to overcome that. And I'll show you a little of those data later. So that's one example of uh, some of the uh, uh, two of the courses that we're offering, and uh, I showed you very briefly some of the others. Um, so let me tell you about some of the other characteristics that we have. So we're competency-based, and what does that look like? So this is, for example, for the physical activity and health training, and don't worry, it's really not necessary for you to read this, but to simply grasp the concept that what we do is we pair existing competencies in this case, competencies from the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, and we pair them with existing high quality resources. Um, and uh, we also pair them with learning activities. So some competencies are knowledge competencies, those we addressed with the learning resources from our four accredited sources. And then we also create uh, learning activities with mentors and peers to do the skills-based competencies that people need as well. Here are some examples of uh, where uh, at one practicum site um, these, this set of skills-based competencies were addressed. And then we organize the learning activities and the skills-based competencies, the mentor and peer activities, into modules and post them. So another characteristic that we have is that we've tested our efficacy. That kind of goes with that penultimate uh, bullet down at the bottom there of open research policy. But let me show you some of the tests that we've done. So we've, we started with um, three courses and three countries as a pilot design. And I'll show you data from these first two where we have data back already. Uh, emergency medicine, which I mentioned, our first launched course. Um, and environmental health, our first core course uh, required for the MPH. So these are, this is, uh, if you want to come back and revisit it and see a little more detail, uh, these are these first two courses in emergency medicine, first two pilots, but I'll show you some of the highlights of them in a moment. The physical activity course and the environmental and occupational health course. So let me, let me show you these in a little more detail. So this again is the first course that we offered starting in March 2012. Um, and we have three highly respected US-based global emergency medicine um, organizations for this. Uh, Emory Center for Injury Control is a WHO collaborating center in injury control. And these two organizations, the Society for Emergency Medicine is the, uh, for uh, academic emergency medicine is the global organization of uh, researchers and teachers in emergency medicine. IFEM is the global organization of practitioners in emergency medicine. So this is the kind of uh, cohort of co-sponsors that we uh, have really for all of our, all of our courses. Uh, organizations that provide us feedback and provide our learners reassurance. All of the courses are competency based. So in this case, the competencies are based on the clerkship directors in emergency medicine what they say senior medical students need to learn. And we 
address, again, the knowledge competencies with resources from government specialty societies, peer-reviewed journals, and universities, or four approved sources. And then our skills-based competencies people do with their mentors, right? Things like uh, starting an IV or observing casting or uh, taking a patient history. Those are activities just like all of us who've gone through medical school. You have a list of things you're supposed to go over with your mentor and uh, they have to do those as well. So this is what the home page looks like and these are some of our data. So this is an, a comparison of uh, next gen users as you probably discerned from doohickey. I'm kind of a sucker for puns. So next gen users versus traditional students emergency medicine scores. Uh, this test was done at the United States Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences and you can see essentially identical knowledge scores. This is on the National uh, Emergency Medicine Exam for senior medical students. Essentially identical knowledge scores with, uh, with the students who took our training versus students uh, who took the traditional training in the prior year. Same thing with, again, the emergency medicine course tested at University of Missouri. Essentially identical knowledge scores uh, compared to uh, nationally uh, trained uh, students. And then this one is for uh, the public health, our first public health course, environmental and occupational health. Again, essentially identical knowledge scores and a much higher rating overall in terms of their satisfaction with the course, um, which was really quite remarkable to us. Uh, also reported by students um, in the emergency medicine course, greater satisfaction with the course than with traditional training, even in some of North America's most resourced universities. So this was really quite encouraging to us. We have qualitative data, though. So this is from the Africa Mental Health Foundation. This is for the uh, substance use course. And um, let me read that to you. For one, it's all about the knowledge. Also, you find that the things I was taught in the course itself are not necessarily what you get from the classroom. In my course, you'll need to deal all about the complications and all that. But when it, came, when it came to the course, this course specifically, you find that you're taught new skills, new knowledge which are not acquired from the classroom. You find yourself better equipped to meet the people out there in the community who are struggling with substance abuse and all of the conditions which are contained in the course. And similarly, I'll, um, I'll come back to these at the end. I'll just pause for a moment and let you look at them. I'll come back to that last one at the very end. So we have, we're testing these both with quantitative tests and with qualitative tests to make sure that our learners are, are satisfied. Um, we're available in multiple languages um, through the magic of Google Translate. I know it's not wonderful, but it falls into the substantially better than nothing category. And it's kind of nice. It's not just the uh, resources themselves, but um, also the chat rooms, as you'll see. And one kind of nifty piece about it is uh, you can hover your mouse over whatever has gotten translated and see it in the original English as well. If you're trying to learn medical English, it's a nice tool to be able to do that. Um, so now to the human interaction part, because that, that really is what I think, to me, in addition to being for credit for free, is the other really wonderful value added that we're bringing. So here's an example for the mentored activities and emergency medicine. These are the things that you need to do with your mentor. This is what clerkship directors in emergency medicine say that you need to do to be competent as a graduating medical student. Similarly, this is a, a peer um, activity. Everyone has to create three multiple choice questions and peer review the three multiple choice questions associated with the course of three peers. So this then, uh, people have to meet these criteria, be assessed by their peers as having met these criteria, and then these questions become available to us to review and insert into our question bank. So this becomes 
a way to refresh our, our question bank on an ongoing basis. Uh, we have chat rooms and fora. Uh, we have exercises like this is an exercise of learning about what do people, if you're a senior medical student in the emergency room, what do people other than docs do in emergency rooms? So this teaches students how to, how to do that. Uh, and we also, for all of our courses, uh, have case studies that need to be created and peer reviewed as well. And uh, our partner, RealDX, which uh, provided that video that uh, Dr. Abdel Nasser spoke on and really typically do have very good audio <laughs> with their video as well, um, that's a wonderful tool that where our residents and learners are able to upload their own video case studies. Um, so, and uh, that's a really, and then also to uh, share them, to have them published globally, uh, creating an atlas in all of our courses, an atlas of case studies from around the world that will become globally available for free. Uh, there are also computerized interactions. So, uh, as I mentioned, um, there are uh, the peer uh, multiple choice questions and case studies, the mentored activities discussion fora and chat rooms, and we even have word games. Uh, and then there are opportunities for feedback, both to the learners and from the learners. So there's a feedback opportunity for each resource, which I'll show you in a moment. There's peer feedback for the posted assignments, things like the multiple choice questions and case studies. There's the opportunity for free text feedback in the fora and chat rooms. Uh, there are course evaluations at the end of each course, and there's also live technical support. Uh, we also have assessment, as I said, of the students. So the feedback both comes from the students and goes back to the students. So let me tell you about that 360 assessment. Um, so students are able to assess the learning objects themselves. Again, I'll show you that in a moment. They're the peer activities as part of it. They're mentor activities. And then after each module, uh, there are quizzes that refer directly back to those learning objects. And there also is a final exam as well. So this is the opportunity after each resource. If a student wants, they can rate the resource. They can tell us how long they spent on it. Because we put an estimate of the time that should be spent on each resource based on someone's reading rate. So they can tell about how long they should spend on it. Uh, and they can suggest alternative resources if there are others that they think are better. Uh, this is a quiz after uh, one of the modules for cardiovascular disease prevention. Uh, it gives you feedback and gives you the opportunity to go back immediately to the uh, learning object that it was taken from if you didn't perform well. Um, this also is a place for feedback. Again, as I mentioned, you create these multiple choice questions using these criteria and then let your peers know whether they fulfilled the criteria. This is our uh, final exam, uh, timed, as you can see, uh, available in all our languages. Um, I'll be terribly embarrassed if we get a Twitter response from someone telling me that this really has nothing to do with anything in NextGenU, but apparently this is our final exam. Um, and there's some nifty aspects to the final exam. Um, we can video record, again, for free, students who are taking the exam. We can uh, freeze the cut and paste functions on their computer so it makes it harder uh, to plagiarize. Uh, we can look at the uh, any sites that they access while they're taking the exam. Uh, and we also, if that's not enough, if a local institution has adopted the course, uh, we can give them their own customized final exam that they can give directly to their students if they prefer that. Obviously, highly customizable as well. Um, and, oh, sorry. Uh, and the other part to point out that I want to expand a little more uh, in and we're getting close to the last slides here, obviously. Um, the other characteristics I want to highlight in these last little bits, um, we have active educational partnerships with all of our partners around the world who want to have partnerships with us. So you can take these courses as an individual and get a certificate for them, or you can interact with us, or if you're a university or a hospital that wants to start a residency program or offer a course. We're delighted to work with you, make your own 
uh, classroom that you can access, and I'll show you about that. It respects teachers and learners. It doesn't make us waste our time on hauling to a place to necessarily have to listen to a lecture in a classroom with apologies to those of you who decided to do so today. Um, and we have an open research policy. So these are some of the metrics that we have for all of our students, sort of standard uh, kinds of outcomes uh, in, in terms of demographics. Uh, and we're able to stratify all of our data by that. Uh, as I said, we can make a customized classroom, again, for free for a university or uh, any organization that might want to offer this, stratified by individual students, or this is one of the things that I really like as a professor, stratified by competency. So you can see, oh, my students all did really well on, in this area, studying on their own, but they did poorly in that area. Let's take an hour this week and go over this in some more detail. Um, there are some challenges uh, to our uh, data analysis. When we ask people for their degrees, they put in all sorts of things, um, which, of course, is a research challenge, but uh, one that we accommodate. Um, and we end up with some very nice uh, kinds of data. So uh, these are some of, our, uh, some of our data from some of our first courses early on. Um, and we can stratify by age. Kind of nifty to me that folks who are 55 to 64 represent our second largest bolus of people taking this. You know, you think that this is only for those who you know maybe have maybe have hit puberty, but actually it really is something that um, even you know even uh, mature adults are able to to learn this way. Um, we have uh, great use by women and. One of, the, um, one of the particularly nice things about this to me, if you think back to that early slide about uh, girls uh, getting primary schooling, that this uh, breaks down a lot of barriers for both men and women, but uh, particularly for women, such schooling is often uh, constrained. And so it's wonderful to us that we have such heavy use by women. Um, and that's true for, for all of our courses, though so there's some variability in what people uh, choose, and you don't have to indicate your, your gender when you're signing up either. So these are some of the 118 countries um, that are now using NextGenU courses. Um, and uh, I want to pause on this one. Anyone know where this is? It's a whole country. I'm going to go back for a second. It's uh, one of the countries taking our climate change and health course. Sorry? Christmas yep, Christmas Island. And this is you know, both wonderful and tragic, of course, because Christmas Island is one of the many places around the world that um, is going to be a really serious victim of climate change is already. Um, it'll disappear, probably, in, if you look at their um, at their topography. It'll disappear in um, a few years to decades. And being able to bring this kind of training in Sudan, they're very interested also in our climate change and health course and in our war and health course. Um, so that's uh, encouraging and also tragic. Um, but we're able to look at our users all over. Um, and see where we're being used um, for all of our courses. And we're able to drill down with great specificity. And you know, epidemiology being uh, a collection of uh, these kinds of individual observations, uh, it's lovely for me to see some of the places where we're being used. Um, I want to pause for a moment on this one. So this was entered um, by uh, an emergency medicine resident in Cairo using um, our training. Uh, they put down two things you might notice. They put down that they were training at Aslam International Hospital. Uh, and you can see a little about that there. This is where their sites are for that hospital. But they also put down, as you can see, that they were accessing this from Tahrir Square. 
and of course, again, in terms of inspirations about where and when these kinds of trainings can be used and who this can be useful for, um, I find this really quite remarkable. So this brings me to the last piece I want to mention, this last slide. Um, this is, again, from, uh, from uh, the Africa Mental Health Foundation and from our training of our addiction medicine course. And this is one of our outcomes. And again, this is, I think, a great example of warm prestige. So I've gotten to know how to handle people with these struggles. Because in the beginning, I could not. Because I looked, I used to look at these people like people who are just failures, people who don't really, really want to work in life. But then I got to change that perspective of mine. So I can say that that's a skill I've acquired, that now I know how to approach them. I don't just go with them with a stereotypical mind that these people are just failures in the community. And it really makes me so happy that I'm, I'm glad that we're doing a great job with knowledge transfer. That's really encouraging. But I'm really glad that we're able to go all the way through to the kinds of, um, the kinds of beliefs and behaviors and cultural norms that we hope get transmitted in the very best education. So that's what I wanted to present to you. Uh, delighted to take questions and comments. Um, you'll see in the bottom right there my contact information for those who don't get their questions or comments um, in today or for those who want to find out more or get to collaborate with us. So thank you. Thank you so much, Erica, for such a, a, a fascinating journey through the work that you've been doing over these last uh, few years. I, I think we can open it up both to those here in the audience, but also to anyone who may have questions who's been listening to this presentation online. So um, if we can start, I'll look for hands in the audience, but also if there are any of our um, uh, uh, questions coming through Twitter or, or email, I'm happy to take those as well. Um, just want to know, uh, just to get this clarified, uh, you said that you are training family physicians in Africa. So it doesn't mean these are people who are uh, just passed out from school and are training in medicine? You're starting their medical training using this? Or they do they already have some medical training and then you're upgrading their knowledge and skills? So, um, so the, the latter, and to expand a little on it. So um, Sudan has 30 medical schools. They don't have a shortage of physicians, but they have practically no graduate medical education. So their government had decided before we came along, as Dr. Abdel Nasser mentioned, that just in the state of Jazeera, that they needed to have 10,000 family docs. So they have the, this these large boluses of physicians, but um, they didn't really have a, a way to give them residency training. So uh, we certainly, we have many courses also available for medical students, but yes, this is uh, after people are fully done as MDs or DOs or whatever one's local equivalent is thereof. Uh, this is a residency program. Same thing for the preventive medicine residency program. This is intended for people who are already fully trained as physicians but want to have specialty training. And then on average, how long does it take? Yeah, so uh, in terms of the length of completion, so in Sudan we're doing it in two different ways. Uh, we're doing a two-year family medicine residency program, and then we're doing a four-year master in family medicine as well. Um, the uh, preventive medicine residency we're doing as a three-year preventive medicine residency, same way as uh, we do it in the United States, a year of clinical work, a year for the MPH, and a year of practicum, which can be integrated. Because we do uh, very much, we and our partners very much want people to train in place. Um, it's worth mentioning as a specific advantage so that you know, in Sudan, these residents are being paid by the government and by the health insurers, their, their salary is paid, their clinic is paid, and their uh, colleagues within the clinic are paid. They're given a laptop and a connectivity, same thing for their mentors. And then they go out to these rural and remote sites, or perhaps they're already functioning there as a physician. And this kind of training in place 
we don't have data yet ourselves, but we know from many other studies that have been done with many other educational tools that if you train in a place and if your family's there and if, you're, uh, if you feel like this is your community, then you're much less likely to leave and become part of the brain drain that the first 200 uh, family medicine residents that they trained without us in Sudan, it took them three years to do it, and all of them were immediately taken up by neighboring countries which had the money to be able to pay them 10 times as much. So what we're doing is by letting them train in rural and remote areas and be supported and have intellectual support, the idea is that that reduces the brain drain and we can do it at sufficient quantity that we'll be able to, Sudan can still do some exportation of physicians as part of what they do, but they also will have these residents while they're in training and many of them choosing to stay as well. So that's, that's how all those pieces will fit together. Other questions here? Yeah, there's another one in the back. Great. Thanks, sir. Just so they can hear us. So my first question is in relation to, say, the emergency medicine course. How do you assign clinical supervisors for the procedural skill yes. part of that course yes. um, for those trainees? So the best way that our courses get used, especially ones like that, is for an institution to adopt them, right? So um, Uniform Sur Services University of the Health Sciences, there was a clerkship director who was the new clerkship director, and he wanted to have something a little more exciting and engaging um, and uh, contemporary for their students than just giving them a textbook, right? So um, they, the students were all assigned to hospitals as they always are, uh, to emergency departments in those hospitals, and they would go there and they'd you know, do their 50 hours a week of shifts with a mentor there. And uh, so the institution gave them those links. The second way we do it, if there's an individual um, who wants to take a course, uh, say climate change and health or uh, something, some other topic, that that individual can make a personal relationship with a mentor who can supervise them and provide them with those kinds of interactions. The third way we're doing it, uh, including in Sudan, is uh, they have heretofore had done local mentorship, but as Dr. Abdel Nasser mentioned, they've only got 10 family docs in Sudan. So we're working with WANCA, which is the International Organization of Family Medicine Physicians, uh, with Prima FAMED, which is the primary care and family medicine network in Africa, so that cohort as well. And from that cohort, we'll be doing remote uh, telementoring. Uh, our colleagues in Sudan have, um, they're about to publish 4,000 telementoring encounters that they did before we even came along, where every week or so they spend time with their mentor and with patients that they particularly want to see with the help of a mentor. Um, and they get that live interaction where their mentor can really do everything except for sniff their patient, really, um, and have a, a, a good interaction that way. So three ways. Universities provide them, individuals find them, or we work with co-sponsoring organizations to provide a telementoring experience. Okay, thank you. Do you mind if I ask another question? Be delighted, yeah. It's just in relation to assignments. Um, you didn't really mention any kind of essay writing components of the course, and I was all courses available. I was wondering if that was part of the study um, and who kind of marks those. I mean, it, it may be a similar um, answer to your, to your first in, in terms of yeah. the relationships that you have with existing So um, um, for all the narrative components, those are assessed by peers and by mentors. So um, we give very specific criteria about what you need to do with each narrative assignment to fulfill uh, the criteria, both for the, the learner author and also for the learner peer reviewer, right? This is what you need to do, this is what you need to produce. Um, and, 
and we also, uh, some of them are also mentor uh, evaluated and your mentor gives feedback on them as well. And then we also have these um, video case studies that we create as well, which uh, allow people to give narrative without necessarily having to be able to write it properly, and then it can be translated too. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Do we have remote questions, or could we take another question from yeah? Take one more. Sure. Hey. Hi. Sorry. Uh, so I just want to ask you once more about your financial model. Uh, I, well, you say that it is all. The, is it the knowledge component which is free? For instance, if you need mentors who are mentoring on a daily basis and. Um, doing this assessments and, and um, you know, assessing essays and stuff. Surely there is a cost, and also the technology involved, um, surely there is a cost incurred at the institution which is actually delivering it. How is that met? Yeah. So um, the cost to the institution, uh, it depends on where you are. So in the primitive country in which I was born in the United States, uh, we don't pay our mentors. And so uh, that's when I ran the preventive medicine residency program there, um, we had volunteer mentors. In the much more sophisticated education country of Sudan, uh, they pay their mentors and the government of Sudan, uh, the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health has said, and in, and in Canada too where I now live, uh, the ministries have said we're going to pay people to teach. So um, it depends on where you are, how that's structured. It also depends on the course. Uh, you know, some of them, if you're going to be teaching uh, a, whole, um, a whole family medicine residency's worth of emergency medicine, right, and spending many hours doing that, then it probably is the case that you want to find some compensation for it. If you're mentoring somebody on a, pa on a topic that you're passionate about and it's just a few hours here and there, like war and health or climate change and health, then the hope would be that people would be more willing to volunteer. So it depends on the circumstance. Great. Um, thank you so much. So we have a couple of questions from Twitter. I'm going to start really um, from a very exciting one from Cairo, where a colleague of ours is actually working right now um, with the WHO to develop an EMRA regional framework to scale up mental health. So um, very exciting that they're tuning in. Uh, the first question was that they're really enjoying the webcast. Um, one question was, what was the biggest single challenge you faced transitioning to Sudan specifically? Oh, none. And this was really quite amazing. So let me describe this because both for you all here and for the remote listeners, this is really useful. So thank you. Um, so um, how that how that relationship with Sudan started was um, a medical student who was working with us on NextGenU uh, presented uh, a lecture very similar to this at a global conference and afterwards I arranged to be with her and with anyone who had interest in it afterwards by Skype. So we had this room full of people uh, and they sort of lined up and I felt like, I don't know if this will be at all obvious to your listeners, but like a short order cook. So one person said, I want a course in this, and another person said, I want a course in that. And Khalid Mohammed came up and he said, I'm in Sudan and we need to train 10,000 family docs. I said, yep, glad to do that. And that was how we started. And uh, they, you know, they already had the um, infrastructure to make this happen. We really... It's so, it was so easy because they had the people on the ground, they had the government commitment, and so there really weren't uh, any barriers in that case to making it happen in Sudan. Great. Um, just to follow up with another direct message question, um, you mentioned uh, some challenges in using novel teaching techniques in the project in Kenya. Um, can you describe those further in terms of what the learners did or didn't really like about the approach? Um, it's the way that it is easiest we have found and others have found for anyone to learn is in community, right? In a classroom with other learners, with other teachers, and usually that kind of community is sitting in a classroom, right? So 
trying to figure out how do you have the motivation in this case because they weren't all they're ending up with at the end of it is a certificate um, so they didn't uh, helping them feel motivated to go all the way through to the end when they didn't have somebody sitting next to them who raised an eyebrow when they you know did badly on a test or you know some other kind of immediate human feedback was a problem but that's of course why we built in the peer and the mentored components to try to minimize those barriers, to try to give those kinds of supports. Um, but uh, for a motivated learner, um, which uh, presumably uh, people who are signed up to do a whole residency program, for example, they will be, uh, we hope we'll have pretty substantial success in, in getting them through to the end. Great, and then a, a different one actually was also on um, the project in Kenya, it was how do you overcome the local resource and infrastructural limitations uh, specifically to enable computer-based learning, um, you know, in Kenya and other maybe low and middle income contexts? Yeah. So uh, in Kenya now, there really is a remarkable um, fiber optic infrastructure that exists and is growing. And in Sudan, they have uh, amazing uh, satellite connectivity. Um, because they're dealing with uh, rural and remote um, uh, institutions. And I was quite serious when I said that this really is the most, not just the largest scaled use of, of this tool, but really the most sophisticated. Because we're, because they have that kind of satellite connectivity, um, they're able to have really excellent um, uh, speed in terms of their learning uh, and in terms of their getting the resources up. Um, and the other piece of sophistication, though, that's there is they've got electronic medical records. So what we're going to be able to do, just in case you didn't get this from what Dr. Abdel Nasser and I were saying, we're going to be able to go from a competency, which um, Wonko or another international organization says that a family doc needs to have, we're going to be able to track that competency for an individual physician to how they did in testing on that competency for their knowledge and their skills all the way through to their patient outcomes. So it's, um, it really is this incredible leapfrogging in terms of what we'll be able to do with the assistance of information communication technologies, even uh, in places that we think about as being low resourced. We're going to be, we're doing this, I think, in a really sophisticated way. We had one question from Twitter um, from Mary De Silva, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. loves uh, all topics surrounding evaluation. Um, do you want to ask you specifically? Sure. Uh, she, you kind of answered it halfway through the talk, but I was most interested in how you maintain standards, because I know that for our DL distance-based learning here, for example, it's quite intensive you know, tuition that goes on involving a whole backroom of, of teachers, and obviously that's not something that can be scaled up globally. At uh, not at huge cost. So how do you know that the people graduating from your programs really have the skills? I mean, I know you talked about the exams you give and, and that kind of stuff, but so. Yep. Very important question. So um, right now, what we're offering, uh, let me talk about the pieces we're offering now, and then I'll talk about when we hopefully transition to degrees. So for courses and residency programs, um, essentially these courses operate for medical schools and schools of public health, because that's really where we're focused for now, though any listeners who want to expand us, great. Um, but um, these function as away rotations, right? So it would be as if you came here to spend a month or a semester. You can do that instead, but from home, right? So um, we're able to provide back to home institutions or to your boss or to your mom or whoever you want to see your outcomes, far more um, evaluative components than I typically give as a professor with a student coming to, to spend a month or two with me. So usually you might get a sentence or two or maybe even just a check mark from a physician saying or professor saying, yep, they were here and they spent this time with me. Uh, so the feedback we can give to home institutions your quiz scores, your final exam scores, those compared with others at your same level of training and 
from your same country even. Um, we can give your work products in terms of your, uh, your case studies and multiple choice questions, your mentor feedback, and your peer feedback. So that's a really rich set of evaluations for the courses that come back to the learner and can come back to a home institution. For the residency program, um, like every residency program, uh, admission and accreditation happen at a local level. So we're working with the local ministries to help, because they don't even have a board certification exam or observe structured clinical exams, right, to be able to train and test people at the end. So we're working with these local institutions um, to provide, um, to create essentially uh, a board certification mechanism where we provide the knowledge base testing again, and they provide locally the observed structured clinical or public health training as well, so an oral exam, for example. Um, when we get to courses, we'll have, to, when we get to full degrees, um, we'll have to figure out better how to do the admissions piece and the graduation piece, because we won't be, uh, we w we're going to try to do that in a way that uh, allows people to come in fairly freely, um, since there's no cost to us and no cost to them but the time spent on learning, uh, to make sure that they pass each of these iterative components along the way, both from a knowledge perspective and a skills perspective. And then we'll have to find some local mechanism or a remote uh, Skype-based uh, oral exam, for example, for public health. Um, so for now, loads of, I think, far better feedback than I ever give or get as a professor with students who travel elsewhere, uh, the opportunity locally to make the decisions about licensure and accreditation, and then eventually we're going to be incorporating those components in when we offer a full degree on our own. Oh, great. Oh, goodness, it's already almost two. Great. Well, yes, we are. We're, we're running close to the end of our, our allotted time. So thank you so much, Erica, for your fantastic presentation. I'm delighted that we've had such great questions from the audience here and, and from our online viewers as well. Um, really exciting topic and perfect for our very first uh, webcast. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.